Gadget UK here again. As you can see, I'm looking at the uh, Amiga CD32 here. Hopefully this is going to be the final part. I've got some replacement lasers here. Um, I've ended up with four actually. I ordered one from uh, the UK seller. Um, just because these ones from China, uh, the three ordered from China. Uh, I thought they were going to take a while, but they've turned up actually before the one from the UK. So yeah, I'll have four of these in total. Uh, so you can see the laser there. I'll get my ESD uh, wrist strap on in a sec before I attempt to uh, replace this. Um, there's probably going to be uh, an ESD, you know, anti-static blob somewhere on there. Um, maybe not, I don't know, but as you can see it's a KSS210A. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to show you me stripping the system down, because I've covered that in previous videos. I think in part one I did a teardown of this initially. Um, but what we'll do is once we get to the drive I'll just show you how I'm going to get, you know, get the old laser assembly off there. Um, and put the new one on. So I think to get the drive out we're going to need to undo these screws here, there's four that uh, mount uh, the, uh, that metal part of the chassis there onto the plastic. Uh, and I think it should all come off as one module, this back, back metal piece of shield here is perhaps just clipped on or something. should be easy to get that off once we've got the whole the drive assembly out but I think just these four screws here uh, are what's securing it. Yeah, so it just pulls off as an entire uh, unit here, as you can see, it's uh, manufactured by Chin on the CD1 drive, assembly 365161. So that gives us a good chance to examine the gears and things on here, uh, it looks okay. Yeah, so it's one of these where you just bend this little butt plastic piece up here, and then you can push the bar from that side and it should, you know, uncatch at this side. So I think I'd recommend removing that gear there first, and you can just about see uh, the white uh, plastic uh, clips here. It should just be a case of just pinching those ever so slightly and pushing it. You can see I think it should have popped off because it slid out there. Yeah, so we'll just pull that out, put that somewhere safe. Uh, I think the other thing I'm going to do is remove the shield here. Um, three little black screws around there. Just to make it easier to pull this off from the top side uh, rather than the bottom side. Obviously disconnect these, these uh, cables here, we'll do that as well in a sec. So I've removed the red and white connector and we've removed that gear so I'm just now going to carefully push this. Can you see it starting to come across? So I just need uh, to put a point or two on this side here I think uh, and just push it a little bit further. You can see it started to come across there and we'll perhaps just use some pliers here just to very carefully see if we can uh, assist this. There you go. Uh, so you can see it's uh, free on this side now. That should help us uh, remove it I think. So I meant to do this step before but uh, I forgot, so I just removed the uh, shield there and we'll just see if that uh, makes it any easier. I'm not sure if having removed this uh, thing on this bar here is going to make that easy to get off or not. Because you see we need to somehow get the bar completely out of the way. Uh, the obvious thing to do would be to remove the four screws here and detach the uh, main part of the drive from the you know this wider chassis. So you can see what I've done there, is after those screws have come out, I've carefully flipped it over and put it this way up. There is a connector down here, on, you, could, you know, that blue cable there, the blue uh, wires, you could disconnect that. So this is not the easiest thing uh, I have to work on in terms of these uh, CD units here. Uh, if I just turn this round a little bit, hang on. Uh, and you can see what I'm doing here, is just going to push this bar even further, all the way to about there. That should hopefully allow us to move this across, there you go, and completely detach this. Bear in mind this is it's faulty, I'm pretty sure it is. It's either got a faulty uh, uh, laser diode there or it's going to be the, the coils. Probably the laser diode because tweaking it up as we saw in the previous video there, the first part, uh, brought some life into it. But it was quite a, long, you know, quite a lot of adjustments. Um, you can see, I'll just turn this around, you can see how far it was adjusted last time there. You can see a little green mark there, my nails need cutting again, I'll do them in a minute um, yeah you can see the green mark in the middle and the little one on the yellow uh, bit there so it's moved you know uh, I don't know three or four or five degrees to the uh, uh, left hand side there so I'll get the new one, I don't think we're going to need to replace this bit because it's already on the other assembly as far as I can see, I don't think there's anything to swap over the main thing is just to inspect around and look for any uh, ESD protection blobs uh, sometimes there'll be one, in fact it could be that there, can you see? Uh, that looks like something that's perhaps been removed from there in the past, so we'll compare it to the, the new one. Um, ESD wrist strap 
on. Yeah, so that is the ESD uh, protection blob. So all I need to do is just get some desolder braid and uh, just uh, add a bit of flux press and just suck that solder away there. I'll show you that in a sec. Um, and then carefully uh, slide this on. I've set the potentiometer in exactly the same position as the old one was originally. Now, I'm not sure it's the same pot actually, but I mean, the, the assembly is the same, the board's the same layout stuff, it is a replica. Um, but they may well be using a different pot here to accommodate the laser diode that's on there. So I will need to, and I will be doing this anyway, getting the RF, um, the scope onto the RF test pad. So I'll have a look for that in a minute. But just in the first instance, because I've got th four of these lasers, um, I figure we could just go for broke. We'll set it in the default position. I'll just see see whether it works or not. And at that point, we'll then perhaps go away and look at the RF level. I will do that, though, anyway. So I've got a little bit of flux on there. It's going to be hard to try and uh, hold this and film at the same time. Hopefully you can see the uh, pad there. So we'll just uh, heat that. And hopefully... There you go, you can see. Can you see those are separated? So the next step here is to uh, just carefully hook this onto the back part there. As you can see, line it up with the bar. And then just gradually, sorry, knocking the camera, slide this bar along until we get to the point where it's ready to uh, clip back in on this side and uh, then perhaps do the last bit with a flat tool or something a screwdriver there we go yeah that's back in so once the gear is there and all the ribbons and things are connected back up uh, we should be done so I'll just reassemble it yeah so that was quite straightforward uh, we'll get this gear back in place now so the key here is to make sure you don't uh, jam yeah, you need to do it till it rotates like that, and you've got to watch out for the teeth here to try and align those. Just gradually, uh, carefully, uh, clip it back into place only when it's lined up properly. Yeah, there we go. The interesting thing with this, I never like these. I prefer the ones with a flex ribbon because this type of cable doesn't last forever. Uh, I mean, you can. Uh, just carefully just move that with the gear you can see can you see the the wire bend in there you know at some point you could get a problem with the the cables on a drive like this more much more like probable you know than with a flex ribbon just make sure these connectors down here are in firmly as well uh, I think while we're here we should be able to clip this piece off actually it looks like can you see it's uh, it's clipped in uh, there so if we just get a little flat blade that should then come off uh, you've got to be careful the ribbon here you can see it comes out down there so we'll have to feed the ribbon through that little gap and I think just for the moment we'll leave that off just because it'll make it easy access to find the RF test pad and stuff in a minute what on earth is that? it's like an aftermarket thing going on there uh, I'm sure it's uh, it came from the factory They probably some of them probably shipped with that on there but it's a bit unusual so the good thing is, as far as I can see, there's lots of test points marked. You can just see here, hopefully you can see the, uh, without the reflection there. I just need to try and find the RF test pad, but initially I'm going to uh, connect this up and just power this up as is, just to see what happens. If it doesn't, you know, test it for a few seconds, if it doesn't boot a disc, uh, I'll then get the, uh, the scope on there. But I'm just curious to see whether it'll work without any adjustments at all, just having set the pot there in approximately the same position as the original one was. So just temporarily uh, held in with two screws here and as you can see you've got that shielding piece missing off there, that should be okay. Um, I'll just connect this up and give it a try. So I've pointed you at the screen, uh, let's give that a try. Yeah, I think that's booted. That looks like uh, the normal boot screen to me. So the bear in mind that's on this default setting there, I've not had to uh, tweak it up or anything like that yet. Fantastic. It's a sound bit. So I need to connect to controller I think. So after swapping the laser out uh, a couple of days ago, I tested uh, for about three hours actually. I was playing fine, you know, playing various games, having a good fun with the thing really. Um, and then I just switched it off and switched it back on. And at that point the colour just disappeared. As you can see, we've just got 
you know it's just like uh, monochrome here uh, and I'll just show you um, So you can see I've got the scope uh, wired up here. Now the first thing I did is check the S-Video cable for connectivity. And then I inspected around this area here. I was wondering if one of these caps had leaked and corroded a trace or something like that. But no, the caps are, are all okay in good functioning, you know, working order, they're not leaking. Even that one there after I cleaned up the pin with a bit of IPA, it come up, came out super clean. I don't think there's any leakage around there at all. I had a look, look at the components on the underside, looked at the schematics and there's like a, I think there's a few inductors and resistors and caps and things, you know, that uh, feed the uh, chrominance signal from the uh, 1145, here is it, 1145, I get the part number wrong sometimes. Uh, yeah, I think it's the 1145, CXA 1145. Um, there's these little components you can see here, three of them form a delay line for the luminance. Um, and then there's one up here, I think is it Z221? Yeah, it is. That's uh, a bandpass filter for the chroma. Now, first of all, I thought, I did a bit of research and found that, that these fail in some 600s and 1200s, but typically it's the corrosion that causes that when these caps leak, I think, from what I understand. Because all they are is an inductor with a cap, I think there's a little, little ceramic cap inside there, you can actually, I did see a picture of someone took one of these apart, took the metal can off, and inside it's just uh, windings, um, I think it's a couple of different windings with a, uh, a core uh, and uh, a cap, so you can, you could actually fix one of those yourself if you were, uh, you know, articulate enough to take it to pieces and uh, carefully unwind it, count the windings and rewind, you know, rewind it, rewire it with a uh, you know, new wire of the right gauge and stuff. You could uh, potentially fix one of those. You could make one. You could even alter, uh, produce a different circuit there. Because I did have a look at how that um, circuit is done on the Mega Drive. Uh, now, whilst the Mega Drive doesn't natively, I don't think it does, doesn't natively output S video, there is a circuit there that's used, you know, because that circuit still needed, I think, for the composite. Uh, so you could do something like they did in the Mega Drive with a you know a couple of inductors and things and resistors and stuff and replicate that circuit. That would probably work quite well as a replacement, but it would be a total bodge. But anyway, I'm sidetracking. So these are all the things I thought about and looked at, and I thought, okay, if it was the if it was anything to do with this bandpass filter here, the composite would be um, lacking colour as well, and it isn't. If I connect composite up, uh, I'll perhaps just show you that in a sec, we get colour. So the next port of call really was just looking back at the schematics again, trying to understand what might be going on, and I've checked to the, check the connectivity, there's no connectivity issues, it's just not outputting chroma. Um, so the final thing really is this little transistor down here, I think it's Q282. Uh, so I've got my little Velleman portable scope here, and I'm just going to probe, uh, I'll have a look at the luminance one first, and we'll just compare to the chroma, and just see if we can work out whether it's that transistor, I suspect it is, I suspect it that, that transistor. And I did also find a few examples out there of uh, these transistors, the 2N3904s, failing on the video circuit on 600s, 1200s and CD32s. And it seems to be more commonly related to, well, on the 1200, the, the RGB lines, uh, and on the 600, but obviously you've not got RGB uh, coming out of here, there's probably no transistors for that on here, I would think. Um, but those transistors do fail. It's strange uh, how it's failed, really. I, that's that's the bit of a mystery, really, um, because it was you know it was, just fine. it was fine. This board was not exposed like this. The whole thing was actually assembled, and I was using it for a good four hours, I would say. Um, you know, switching it off and on at various points in time there, and it was just like I say, only after switching it off, switching it back on, suddenly the the colour had gone. Uh, now I did wonder if that was something to do with the way this switch works because I think it's uh, double, you know, switching the 12 volts and the 5 volts when you switch this off and on it's doing both rails in theory you could have a, some kind of latch up type or similar scenario going on there where if those, if you've got switch bounce on one rail, say on the 12 volts but the 5 volts are started and the, everything starts to boot up but the 12 volts contact still bouncing there. Um, I mean, it could be talking crap, but I'm just thinking that could be why when I switched off and on, that was when the point when the colour disappeared. Uh, it could also explain why, maybe not, because I think on the 1200 and 600 you'd have a power switch, but in this scenario, I, I've just been trying to really make sense of it, trying to understand why it happened when I switched it off and on. Um, it clearly was something to do with the power going off and then on. Maybe it's the load on the 12 volt line through this ATX power supply. Maybe at the point we switched it off and then switched it back on we had 
at large spike on the 12 volt rail. Um, I'd need to look back at the schematics again, but I think the luminance has got um, the tw a connection to the 12 volt rail there on the collector, one of the caps. It might be the same with the chroma, I can't remember. But yeah, uh, those are just a few things that have been going through my head trying to understand what might have caused this. And obviously the, the other one is ESD, but let's say, you know, yeah, ESD, it could have been damaged at a previous point in time via someone touching the pins on the other end of the S-video cable. That's a possibility. Um, but yeah, I think it's unlikely. It's, it's quite common for those two N3904s to fail. Uh, let's say, usually on the RGB lines, in this case, it seems to be the chroma. So I've disconnected the S-Video from the TV and I've just put the white audio cable there into the composite. Uh, just to show you that we do actually have colour, let's just tilt you down a little bit. Yeah, we do have colour um, when we use composite. So to give that a sec, fingers crossed. There you go. So you could see a slight delay with the colour kicking in there. I don't know, that could be another clue. Let's just try switching it off and on again. Got some image retention now on the screen as well, actually, from the logo. Yeah, I would say that that colour took a second or so to come in there, actually, which is a bit odd. But, it's yeah, it's looking all right. Let's switch it off and on again. Let's just try that one more time. Because just for the first frame or so, do you see that was like monochrome? So, I don't know, maybe that transistor's not the fault. But I'll get the scope onto it now, we'll just have a quick look. So in terms of the colour loss, uh, the first thing I've done here is have a look around the encoder here and tried to follow from the uh, S-Video connector here um, what's going on. You can see so the, the first connection at the top here is the Luma uh, and the bottom one there is the Chroma. So we've got two little circuits here to amplify you know, and isolate the signals that are coming out of the encoder chip here uh, the bandpass filter so the, the delay lines on the uh, luma uh, the bandpass filter is on the chroma um, and then on the uh, connections here for each of those you can see uh, the luma goes through here and it's uh, biased uh, the 12 volt got a diode there um, two, uh, 2N3904 on the luma as well and 2N3904 on the chroma so one of the initial things I did there when I looked at the schematic was just a backtrack here from the chroma connection. Uh, I think there's like a little ferrite bead or something there, a resistor, a cap, uh, another cap. Uh, and I checked all of those things and the, everything was okay connectivity wise, there was no problem. So that was why I came to the conclusion there must be the, either this transistor here or something going on with the bandpass filter. Uh, but even then I thought would that really cause this problem because if the bandpass filter was not working the colour on the composite output down here somewhere wouldn't you know we wouldn't have, we'd lose colour on the composite I'm sure I'm pretty sure um, because that's what that's going to be used for um, so that kind of really just left the uh, the transistor here so I've got this video connected up again not that that's relevant but if we look at the first pin there that's either going to be the base or the collector because I know that pin 3 is the emitter and you can see we've got some activity there and I think this is the one for the chroma if we just check the top pin uh, if we could get to it so that's the top pin uh, again we've got a tiny 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 bit of activity there but that's going to be either the base or the collector and if we have a look at the emitter we've got nothing nada but we have actually got nothing on two of the pins really See, this is on the Luma. We've got quite a, a strong Luma signal there going into the, the transistor for the Luma. And if we just compare that same pin to the one on the Chroma, uh, again, I would say that that looks like a, a decent Chroma signal. We've got some nice uh, peaks and things on there. That's fine. Um, so the final thing is the emitter on each of these. So if we have a look at the emitter now on the luminance, you can see it's emitting a lovely uh, luminance signal there, which is what we expect because we can see that on the TV. But if we look at the emitter on the uh, chroma, it's just flatlined. So I would suggest that unless something's dragging that transistor down the emitter, and I think that's unlikely, it's going to be that uh, that transistor. So I've got the hot air rework station out here. Uh, I'll just uh, crank the temperature up. Uh, I've got some captain tape here just uh, around this area just to protect it a bit. So there's just this transistor that's exposed there, that uh, Q282 I think it is. So bear in mind the uh, board is isolated here 
because uh, you don't want to be heating up or burning, melting anything underneath, etc. I'll see if we can get a better angle. So I'll just heat this area up. It's going to be very fiddly to do this because it is such a confined area. Uh, and I'm just going to try and shift it out of the way. I've got some tweezers somewhere for this kind of thing, but this should be sufficient, I think. There we go. That's free. Don't you can see that? Moved it. So yeah, I did need to crank it up to just over 300 degrees there to get it to uh, come off. It's just sat here, as you can see. So uh, I'll just let that cool down a bit. Just knock that off the board, actually. We can perhaps test that uh, transistor in a minute. But I'll just let it cool down a bit, uh, and then we'll use some flux and desolder braid and get the replacement transistor on there. So I've left that for a few minutes just to cool down. We'll just carefully remove the uh, captain tape here. That's it. Yeah, that's uh, useful stuff. So we'll get a little bit of uh, flux on there. I prefer to remove the solder first. I know some people might just try and heat using SMD and get the component on that way. But I'd rather just uh, remove the uh, solder with a bit of solder braid. Uh, and then put the component on there and just solder the pins manually, you know, just do a bit of uh, drag solder in there if you like, you know, just with a normal solder iron. The solder iron uh, lead is a little bit stretched here. I'm trying to be careful not to get too near that resistor or cap or whatever it is just below there. Yeah, that's not too bad. There we go. Good grief, these are small. You can see that, it's like two pieces of salt. <laughs> the size of it, it's just ridiculous. So I now need to yeah, get that on there the right way up. This is not going to be easy to do. Tweezers is perhaps the best way. I'll just lob it on the board there, I think, and then inspect with a magnifying glass and just uh, flip it over until I get it the right way around and in the right position. So you're on super macro there, you can see it's just, uh, I've just laid it in the right place, it's got a bit of flux there. So I just need to just carefully uh, try and hold that in place and solder one pin, inspect it and then just solder the other two. So the transistor's soldered on there now, I'll just clean it up with some IPA. Just a quick look on macro there after cleaning it up, you can see it's not perfectly straight, it's incredibly difficult to uh, align uh, a transistor like that, it looks a bit better in the light there. But you can see the solder points are good, so we'll give that a try. So the moment of truth here, we're all connected up. Now I'm going to do, instead of using the switch here, I'm going to use the switch on the uh, power supply. I'll just point you at the screen. Uh, and that's because both power rails, in theory, should come on at the same time. We're not going to get the switch bounce on the uh, CD32 power switch there. Fingers crossed. Oh yes. Did you notice we had that same delay there in the colour, just for a second, while it first came on, just for a frame or two. Well, that's brought us colour back. Thank goodness for that. So something else worth pointing out, to remove the uh, ribbon uh, connector here, you could use needle nose pliers and that's exactly what it suggests in the uh, service manual for the CD32. That's probably easier, but as you can see, you know, I've not damaged the connector at any point doing this, it's, you've just got to be careful not to lever it. Uh, and that should just come out. So I'm just about to look for the RF test pad, I'll show you that in a sec. Uh, but something else worth pointing out is this um, bird as someone described it here, is apparently uh, standard. Some of them do have this, not all of them, but some of them do have this here. Um, and I think they're supposed to be, uh, and it's so super duper pointed this out actually, the guy I bought the uh, TF328 from, Mark. Uh, he pointed out that there's like a, a copper spring or something, that, uh, go, or brass, I think, spring that's connected here somehow. And I think that perhaps just joins this board up to the... Um, or give some st physical stability to this board, um, to the stuff that's below it. So the one you, you know, if you press the buttons and things here, it's got a bit of support below. I think, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know where that that spring is actually located. Uh, so what we need to do now is just uh, have a, a scan around 
the uh, drive PCB here before I put the shield and lid back on and stuff and reassemble this totally. Find the RF test pad. Uh, I'll just make sure that the um, the RF level looks okay. It might just need tweaking up a little bit or a little bit down. Uh, I'll go and get a pressed CD. We'll start with a pressed audio CD. So I think I found the RF test pad. It says RFO there. I'm guessing that's RF output. Um, I've had a good hunt around all the other pads and things on there. None of them look remotely um, related. So I think that's it. So we'll get a wire, I'll solder a wire on there so that it extends out the side of the case so I can connect my scope up. So I just had a touch of solder there to that RFO pad. I've already tinned my wire here to that point there. That should do. So I've got my scope on times 10 set in here uh, and we've got one uh, division there representing 0.2 of a volt, so 200 millivolts. So what we're aiming for is 900 millivolts roughly, so we should get uh, four and a half of these uh, divisions here. So I'm playing an audio track here, I'll just mute that actually before I get a copyright strike. Uh, and I'll just put the RF uh, test pad up there. One. Yes, there's the RF level. So we've got like three blocks actually, that's really with the press disc, we've got about 600 millivolts there. Now the interesting thing is, this is different uh, to what Retro Game Mods showed, I think he, I'm sure his was like 900 millivolts or something. If I go beyond 600 it stops reading audio discs, you know, pressed audio discs. Where it is now is a sweet spot, where it's reading um, burnt discs and it's reading pressed discs perfectly. Uh, and the pop position is not dissimilar to um, the original one. So that can only lead me to think that maybe someone's played around with the bias adjustments or something on this, I don't know. But what I do know is, like I say, it works perfectly as it is. So for the moment I'm going to leave it as is. I might revisit this and go through all of the adjustments that Retro Game Mods did in his video. But I need to refresh myself uh, and watch that, that video first, I think. But as things stand, like I say, it's not in a dissimilar position. Sorry, I can't walk in front of the camera there. Not in a dissimilar position to what it was originally. Um, and it's working fine with both press discs and uh, burnt discs. Loading some Banshee here, as you can see. Uh, it's loading fine. I'm using the uh, PlayStation controller. I'll show you the adapter I'm using in a minute. So we'll just skip this. Now, the controller is currently switched into dual button joystick mode at the moment. Uh, and this works okay with this game, but I found that if I put it into CD32 pad mode, it uh, causes some problems actually. It's like automatically firing all the time. I can perhaps show you that part way through this actually. Now, I did uh, contact the guy who makes those adapters. Um, it's a pick based adapter, a bit like the, uh, uh, what's it called? Pest, or Jest actually, because there was a joystick one for the Atari ST, wasn't there? Done by Alison Shallis and Chris Swinson. Um, anyway, we'll start the game here and uh, I'll just show you, it is actually working fine and the colour's back now obviously from the, that, that little transistor we swapped out earlier here we go, yeah, so I can use the uh, D-pad I'll show you actually, if I can I can use the thumbstick there and the X-button to fire, that's all working fine now if I want to switch this into um, you know the CD32 mode what you've got to do is hold down uh, select start triangle and then release select start that should put it, yeah, it has done. You can see that, I'm not even pressing fire. And if I just move around, it's not firing now, but there you go, it fired on its own. Last night, actually, it was firing all the time. Let's just watch, see it's firing? Yeah, so the CD32 mode with this game causes problems. But the funny thing is, I'll just show you, if I boot uh, Pinball Fantasies or whatever it is, or any other game, in fact, it will work okay. So as I said, we'll just load a bit of Pinball Fantasies, uh, just put the disc in. Now bear in mind, I've not uh, powered down the console or anything like that, or did I just put the disc in, so the controller settings are still the same as they were, so just uh, let's just wait for the menu to come up. There we go. Let's do uh, the bottom one if we can, I'm not sure. There we go, I've pressed X, so we'll see which one, it's going to be one of those two tables, I'm not sure which it will be. Now bear in mind, like I said, the X button was playing up on that last game. Uh, and I'll show you, you know, there's, I'm not pressing anything here. If I just press start, that should do that. Now X on this one does the, the ball at the bottom. You can see that works. No problems at all. 
So it's really strange how there would be a problem with one particular game. Maybe it's something to do with the way it polls the port or something. I, don't know. I would think there is a glitch there in the current version of PIC firmware I've got on my adapter. That's what it looks like to me. It's like a timing thing. Because this works sweet. As do other games that use CD32 mode. So anyway, if you know more about that, or you've got experience of using one of those adapters, uh, please post in the comments below. Just loading a bit of Beneath the Steel Sky at the moment, I'll show you that in a sec. But I thought I'd show you the media as well, you know, the discs I'm using here are these Maxell ones, and they're kind of very, a, a sort of silvery with a slight tinge of green, you could say. Um, but the Tao Yudin discs um, don't work at all, they really struggle to read which is interesting uh, and I've had to burn these at times one any of the speed you know two speed might work okay but like I tried initially at 52 speed and it was struggling with every disc I burned so yeah it's back to single speed burn for these so I think I need to plug the controller into the other port actually and um, while we're talking about ports I'll uh, talk again about the uh, Akiko actually yeah let's switch the controller into let's try mouse mode let's see if we can do that Yeah, so I've switched into mouse mode there, just to make it a bit easier for this game. Um, we'll just allow that to uh, go through. I'll just start the intro, I'll just turn it down a touch. Yeah, whilst that's loading, I'll come back to a point I made on the previous two videos, actually. And that was about uh, the fact there's no CAAs and how the connectivity from the joystick port's wired. And I made a mistake there. I revisited the schematics, actually, when I was looking at the stuff to do with the S video. Um, and there are a few different connections that go from the joystick ports and the, I think the P0X and P0Y, P1X and P1Y, P1, yeah, P1Y, they all go to, directly to Paula. And that's interesting because it's kind of, it reminds me of the uh, SID actually in the C64 where the pot X and pot Y, for you know, for your analog inputs there, go to uh, the sound chip. You know, there are actually connections on the sound chip there. And it's the same sort of thing in the this uh, system here. That the let's say the X and Y axes for each of the ports there go to Paula directly. Um, now you've you have got like uh, some caps and inductors and things protecting the input there from you know uh, ESD. But as we found on the uh, Amiga and the C64, you know standard 500, it's not not sufficient really. Sometimes you can still find you damage chips uh, via ESD when you put joysticks in and out if you're not careful. Um, so that was an important point to know, and the other thing with that as well is I think the joystick, uh, was it Fire Zero, Fire Zero and Fire One buttons, one for each port, they go straight to a Kiko with uh, let's say only the, the cap and the inductor to, to protect them. So yeah, I think I'd, personally I'd be tempted when I'm using this, I'm only going to be putting joysticks in, in and out when it's off, and being very careful that I'm not getting anywhere near the pins and stuff. Although it'd probably be okay, I would think. I've not heard of any input problems on CD32s, uh, whereas like, you know, conversely you get a fair few C you know, input problems reported on 500s uh, and on 600 and 1200 as well it does happen. I watched a video recently where someone had to swap CIA out because uh, one of the controller ports was not working. So I thought I'd just show you how you get into the uh, memory manager on this actually. I think you press the uh, X button here and that hopefully should take us into, yeah there you go. So you can see I've got one save game there, uh, Simon the Sorcerer. Now when I originally went in here, I had a whole bunch of different saves there. Um, and you can let, do that, you know, press the X button to put a lock symbol there. That means that's protected so no other game can delete that effectively. Um, but if it's unlocked then, you know, you can write over that. And that's the way it works, is you, you've got to go up and down the list here and make sure there's no padlocks next to them all, which then allows the games to delete those saves to write that 1K of uh, non-volatile RAM there, and that's uh, in the Kiko chip actually, uh, and that's worth pointing out as well actually, a few people have suggested that the Kiko chip is used uh, you know, just for the chunky to play in our stuff, and that's what makes this different from a 1200, well yeah that's sort of true, but it, it, it's not in the sense that the Kiko does a lot more than that, it's the, you know, provides the glue logic there to the CD-ROM uh, side of things, but it also has the timers for the CIAs as we've seen previously. It's got the CIA functionality, the auxiliary serial port runs through there. Um, and you know, obviously in this case it, the 1K non-volatile non RAM as well. So when I'm talking about the X button, I'm talking about on a PlayStation pad. You know, I'm not sure what the button is there on a, a, a CD32 controller. But if I press the circle button here on this pad, 
you'll see this takes us into the language options which you get when you first power this on and in fact I think I had that when I first switched this machine on. So I'll reassemble this now, um, perhaps deal with the, the little bits of paint here, just give it a gentle clean I think before I do that, get my TF328 back in there again. Um, but it's worth pointing out a few other things as well, you know, if you want to watch a full recap of one of these, take a look at the Wax video, I'll post a uh, link to his channel below, Hans, um, because he did a complete recap of one of these, you know, all the SMD caps as well. And you may be wondering why I'm not replacing all the caps as a precaution. And it's a case of, yeah, there's certain systems where I will replace the caps as a precaution. An example may be a C64 or a Spectrum. Um, and if any of the SMD caps had leaked in here, I would be replacing them as a precaution. But none of them have leaked, and I'm absolutely sure of that. It's, I've, you know, I have the scope on here, I've checked all the voltages and stuff. Everything's like, re you know, really smooth, clean levels and things. The display, you know, if you just look at the display here, you know, the display is a telltale sign when you've got problems with the caps on these. It's crystal clear, it's like mega sharp, there's no interference at all, it's like factory. Uh, which was the same way my year 1200 is. Same reason I haven't swapped a single SMD cap out of my 1200. Um, so that's the first element of that. The second ele element is, if the caps in this particular one I've got here have not shown any signs of leakage at all, there's just nothing, and it, it performs perfectly, uh, and everything measures perfectly, why would you want to risk taking all those caps off and putting SMD caps on that you don't know even despite how good quality the brand is you don't know how long those caps are going to last for all you know is you could buy a batch off eBay you know one of these CD32 cap kits and I've got one I'll show you in a minute actually looks good, looks good quality but will those caps last two years three years five years it's anybody's guess whereas if I leave the caps on here now as they are they may last another 10 10 for 20 years you never know um, I mean, obviously, we may revisit. There may be a video in the future where I go, oh, you know, I've had to recap. We've got a few leaky ones. But this is over 20 years old, same as the 1200. The caps haven't failed on that. Why would you want to just replace them anyway? Unless, let's say, there is a reason to do that as a precaution. And I don't see any reason to take, you know, with this, these particular systems I've got here, these two, I don't see any reason to, to do that. Um, it's, in my mind, it's kind of more of a risk to change them just for the hell of it, not knowing how long the replacement caps will last. I would rather just keep uh, keep an eye on this every year or two, I'll just take it apart, inspect it. Uh, and if I sold it, maybe that would change my mind. If I was going to sell this on to somebody, I would perhaps recap it as a precaution. But again, there's no guarantee whether those caps are going to last more than five or ten years. Um, so you've got to question the whole approach there of just coming onto any system, just going, right, first thing I'm going to do is replace all the caps. In my mind, yeah, it can, you can do it either way, and it's a personal choice thing. Some people would always swap out the caps. Um, but as you, you know, I've shown in the PC Engine videos, there were two now with the same caps that needed replacing, you know, the through hole ones, none of the SMD ones. My Super CD ROM 2 still performs perfectly, and I had it apart only just a week ago looking to fit a screw actually, because one, one of the ones was missing when I got it. And the caps are all fine, this is not a problem, it performs perfectly, and I'll bet you anything, 10 years from now, the caps are still fine on that board. Another funny point here to show you is if you've loaded a game and then you, you've just done a soft reset, you try and load something like Beyond the Steel Sky, where it's called, Beneath the Steel Sky, you can get this where it comes up with not enough memory. And it really is just a case if you've not done a hard reset. If I switch the power off at the PSU side, leave it for a few, few seconds there, switch it back on, it will then boot fine. I've noticed that just with one or two games that it's almost like something stays resident. Uh, it does make me wonder if you can get a Guru on here. I bet you probably can actually. I'd be surprised if that's any different in terms of the way the, the, the BIOS works there. Um, but as you can see, that, that's loading now. And at this point here, that's where we got that memory error a minute ago. And that was just because, like I said, had the game loaded just on a soft reset, hadn't powered it off, and then tried to load it again. So just screwing the uh, drive back in here now, got the four screws in to mount the drive. I've uh, bent that little, you know, there's a bit of bent metal. I don't know if you remember from the previous video. Here, I think it was in this corner. Straighten that out. You can see it looks pretty much uh, good as new there. Um, I'm doing this on bubble wrap. That's a good idea, just so you don't scratch the underneath of your uh, drive window there. And something else I found since the last two videos, actually, is it's easier to insert the ribbon from this side here 
uh, and then just pull it over and uh, you know tighten up the connector and stuff So as I'm reassembling here and sticking my TF328 back in, you can see I've done a mod there that uh, Mark uh, Super Duper suggested, and that's actually come out quite well. Actually, it's just an ESD bag cut to size there. You know, a piece cut out for the uh, that top connector there, one for that, uh, and then just some of these double-sided pads on various places on the board there, um, just to uh, hold it on. That looks a lot better than that stupid red tape pad, uh, and it just means, like I say, we've just got a bit of protection when coming around the back here. So I will get a dedicated power supply for this, uh, I'll either get an official Commodore one um, or you can get, I can't remember who suggested it, uh, if I remember I'll stick it up here but uh, it's in one of the previous two videos, um, I think it might have been video in the repair part one someone suggested you can get um, an external hard disk power supply, the sort of thing you use with one of those little external hard disks for a PC and I think they, uh, some of them provide uh, two voltages, five volts and 12 volts, around two amps. So one of those would be useful. Um, and I've got a spare uh, four pin in, so that might be what I go with. Um, but in the meantime, like I say, I'm gonna disconnect these, put this on with a, a thicker piece of heat shrink. Uh, I need to find a piece, perhaps uh, something like that. I don't know, maybe a bit thinner than that. Just to um, hold all four wires at the point where it comes out the back of the housing here, I'll slide the housing on uh, and then I'm just going to use uh, four, uh, sorry three, set four separate pieces actually, I'll stick one on that one as well, the, you know the connector there that's not going anywhere just stick a bit over the end, the idea being that if any of these snap off they're not going to short onto one of the other connections because the last thing you want is say the 12 volt wire snapping and connecting to 5 volts or ground or that other pin, whilst it says it's not used you never know it might go somewhere so I'll just try and show you one of these. I've slid the uh, heat shrink over there. And I've forgotten to put the housing on again. Oh. So I've got the cover on the back there and a bit of heat shrink as well to slide over all of them. Uh, and then just one by one I've been sticking these on. You can see I've done the, uh, the black, the ground there. And I'm just soldering them side on because the wire is way too thick to go into the little hole. Um, and then we'll just slide the heat shrink up, make sure the tip is clean uh, and then just you know you could use hot air uh, I've not got my hot air re rework station out at the moment I did have it out the other day for the uh, S video uh, and just just go over it with the neck of the iron here um, as you can see that's shrinking so just tightening up the uh, strain relief here just to make sure it's as uh, tight as possible Like that. And then we should be able to slide the uh, housing over there. There we go, all done. So I'll just stick a label on this just to say it's for CD32. Uh, we'll just test that, make sure that's uh, okay. It's all reassembled there. I've not got any acrylic paints, and my black paint's dried up, so I'll order some. That might be a future thing, I might show it in another video at some point. But it is all complete, it's all working. Well, thanks for watching, I'll see you soon.